Good evening, everybody. If we could stand tonight. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It's good to be in the presence of the Lord tonight. There's really no other place I'd rather be. I'm thankful to be around everybody. I'm just, it's just good. I'm, we had a great move of God last night at Parma. God's doing great things. We got new people showing up. God's changing lives. He's the living God. He's still doing it. He's still changing lives. Amen. He's good. Is it, does anybody know that he's good? Amen. Do you know that he's your savior, that he died for you? serve a big God. Amen. We're going to go into prayer tonight. If you've got a need, why don't you just make it known by the raising of your hand. He's going to move. I believe that. Lord, I love you tonight. I'm so thankful to be in your presence. I'm so thankful to be around your, around your people, God. I, I'm thankful that we're not alone. And God, I believe you're doing great things, and I, I believe that you're going to continue to do great things. Lord, if there's a sickness in this place, Lord, I, I just pray for your intervenience. I pray for you to step in. God, uh, those dealing with distractions and, and the thorns of this life, Lord, I, I just pray for them to get reconnected to you tonight. God, I, I pray that there will be a fresh flow of anointing in this place tonight, that there will be a fresh flow of your oil flow through our homes and through our schools. And, and, and Lord... I just lift you up for your goodness. If nothing else, Lord, you've been good. I've got a reason to praise you. I've got a reason to worship tonight. God, in the midst of every trial, you are with me. Lord, thou art with me in the valley. God, and I'm going to lift you up tonight. Lord, I pray that your hands upon this service, upon our pastor, upon every Bible study, every time we witness God, I just pray for your presence. In Jesus' name.
on he's the answer to it all he's the answer he's the answer to the depression he's the answer to the emptiness hallelujah thank you Jesus is anybody thankful for his presence tonight anybody know that he's still with you come on he's still working you can be seated if you'd like I think about that song when it says he works in the midst. And I instantly thought, Emmanuel, God with us. He comes down into the middle and works inside out. He came unto his own. He, 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 great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. He come into the world and had 12 disciples and changed the world from the inside out. The Ark of the Covenant was on the inside. And when I get baptized in Jesus name and I get his spirit he begins to change me from the inside out my God can still change a heart when David said create in me a clean heart he can still do it praise the Lord I'm just thankful for the power of God that's in this room right now I'm thankful for his presence hallelujah we could get our ways to give on the board tonight. We have Giveify, PayPal available at riverbendpentecostals.com. Cash and checks can be mailed to Riverbend Pentecostals, 1031 Mill Street, P.O. Box 477, New Madrid, Missouri, 63869. We have pans for offering and, and pans for tithing on the inside, outside. Excuse me. You can text to give at 833-883-9311. He's a mighty God, Brother Shannon. He works through this prayer time after time. If you believe that, will you stand with me and pray this tonight? Upon the authority of your word, I have given, and it shall be given unto me. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I am a tither, and I give my offerings. I bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked. The curse is broken. I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished and royalties received. My whole family saved and serving God in perfect health and abundance, walking in divine favor and blessing. I am blessed going in, and I am blessed going out. And all that I do will prosper. In Jesus' name, amen. You can come forward and give.
awesome high praise. I love you, Lord. You are my God. You are my firm foundation. You are my strong tower. God. I don't even know, Brother Cody, if I even can grasp all of what that means. You could be seated if you like. If we could have Riverbend kids come forward and we're going to pray over them tonight. Amen. We got a good group of children. We got some good teachers too. Lord, would you stretch your hands forward tonight and let's pray over them. Lord, I'm thankful for our children. God, I, I, I know you got a plan for their life. And Lord, I just pray that tonight that you would be their everlasting father. God, I pray that you would be there every step of the way. God, and I pray that they would just draw nigh to you from an early age. I pray that they get a hunger for your word and a hunger for prayer now, Lord. I, I, I pray that your presence is in that room tonight, that you would speak through our teachers. I love you, Lord, and I'm thankful in Jesus' name. All right, Red, if you want to let them on back, buddy. Y'all can go on back. River Bend ignited. I tell y'all what, it just builds my faith to see several of the youth up here singing, Brother Richard. Amen. The more, the better. Amen. Right. I believe the Lord has a big plan for their lives. If you believe that, will you stretch your hand forward with me? Lord, I'm so thankful for our youth, God, and I'm thankful for their hunger. Lord, I pray that you bless that hunger. You, should, you said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. God, I pray that they would be filled tonight. I pray that they are filled with your truth. I pray that they are filled with your spirit. God, I pray that they are filled with the influence of the Holy Ghost. Lord, I pray that you, you, you just touch their minds tonight. And Lord, I pray that any thorns, any distractions, I pray for them to get connected. I pray that your hand is upon Brother Richard as he teaches. In Jesus' name, amen. You want to lead them on back. Is anybody excited for the word tonight? Amen. amen. I'm, ex I'm thankful for truth, as Brother Tripp taught. Truth, it just doesn't leave you the same. That's right. I'm excited for what Pastor has tonight. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Amen. I got enough handouts tonight, I promise you. What with I made more, and we've got several. Whole boatload out tonight. And uh, we got to get that fixed. Even though... At the risk of sounding hypocritical, I, I know I was absent this past week, and uh, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, whatever your pleasure, uh, I'll be out again this week preaching in Heron, Illinois, Sunday morning, and uh, then also next Wednesday night, I won't be here, I'll be going to prison. Uh, I, uh, I've been invited to preach in uh, Moberly Correctional Center and uh, in Moberly, Missouri next Wednesday night. So, uh, But then I got nothing else scheduled until uh, my lovely bride and I go on vacation. And uh, uh, you know, we'll just have to, we won't stay gone as long as Uncle Richard and Aunt Virginia did. Uh, uh, he don't know it, but last week, she tried to get me to feel sorry for her for going to Colorado and going to Mississippi and fishing and all. And then he tried to get me to feel sorry for him. I don't feel sorry for either one of you. <laughs> Go to, to Colorado and just everywhere. Doctrine, part three tonight, which is kind of left over with part two because last week I didn't get done. Because y'all shouted too much and said amen too much and caused me to forget where I was at. So, uh, uh, but tonight, I'm super excited. I hope that those that are watching with us online um, uh, take notice or if perhaps you're watching online tomorrow or the next day, um, I can't tell you how important this is. 
I cannot tell you how important this teaching is. And uh, had some conversations while I was gone um, to Tennessee, and they're dealing with the same thing over there, which is the message you preach is everything. It's everything. It matters what you preach. We cannot preach man-made doctrines. We can't preach traditional doctrines. We can't preach, and we're going to talk about that as we get here a little bit. The Bible has to be the authority. Completely, completely. So we will, over the, thank you, Brother Blake. I about forgot to take it off, but I would have been remembering directly when I had to peel it off. But uh, over the next few weeks, we will explore the essential doctrines of the Bible. Everybody say essential. essential. These are things you got to get. And not only do we have to get them, we have to adjust our lives accordingly. The doctrines of the Bible defined as beliefs and practices of the church regarding God, salvation, our positions on moral and social issues, and we have them. We take strong stands on them, but it's biblically. It's biblically. It's not what Washington does. It's not what Jeff City does. It's what the Bible says. And uh, so, uh, so we'll talk about practices of the church regarding God, salvation, positions on moral and social issues, and principles of lifestyle to which believers should adhere to. Please don't misunderstand me. I am well aware that the latitude and room with which we give people to grow can be misunderstood. I'm not really worrying as much about it being misunderstood by new worshipers as I am being misunderstood by established worshipers, okay, who think, well, all these new worshipers, they can do this, this, this. Well, I guess we can too. No. No, you can't. We're not going backwards. We're not getting more like the world. Don't misunderstand and believe that the tolerance, patience, and understanding that growth and discipleship is a process. We believe that, right? It's a process. We preach and teach that there is a desired end that God has in his mind for the way we're born again and then the way we allow the Spirit to lead our lives. But it does not allow for anything less than complete surrender and submission to God's Word. There is not an attaboy section in heaven. And, and y'all know how I feel about this, but I'm going to say it again, and I know it, it counteracts with some people's ideology. No participation trophies in the kingdom of God. Okay? It's not enough to just show up and get your trophy and go on home about your business. But we're in it to win it. All right? We're in it to allow the Spirit to lead us. This teaching is not good advice. It's not the offering of one way as opposed to another way, but it is a clearly defined pathway first authored and finished by Jesus Christ with the expectation that we will follow it just as completely as he did. Y'all, did that make sense? This is Jesus' idea. Or, excuse me, just for clarity's sake, it's God's idea Manifest in Jesus Christ, he showed us how to start it and he showed us how to finish it and anything less is not good enough. All right? Brother David Bernard said, it is important to remember that only the Bible is our authority for doctrine. We cannot establish spiritual truth by history, by tradition, by majority opinion, great leaders, or personal experiences, but only by the Word of God. I have something in my, in my saved in my notes 
probably the largest evangelical pastor, perhaps most widely read. If I called his name, many of you would understand and know who he is. And Brother David, I have a, a I, I copied it verbatim from him talking where he said, the Bible is not our authority. That's nuts. Without the Bible, we have nothing. Nothing. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. He said that. He said that word's forever settled in heaven. He said that. Okay? Now, among the Jews, I'm in review right now. I hope you got your hand out. Among the Jews, especially in the Old Testament, doctrine or teaching, same thing, serve not simply to rel communicate religious truth, though it does serve to communicate religious truth, right? Y'all got to be with me now. Got to be with me. It's going to be a long night if we don't get together. Because I got a book up here. And I'm not afraid to use it. Teaching does communicate religious truth. But that's not all it does. According to the Jews, of which culture the Bible is written, doctrine, teaching, like we're teaching tonight, is designed to bring the one taught into direct confrontation with the divine will. Can somebody explain to me what that means to you? That the teaching of the word is designed to bring you into direct confrontation with the divine will. And before you say anything, I'm going to tell you that applies to everybody. Yes, sir. It does. It tells you what God's will. But what does it mean that the word is designed to bring you into confrontation with the divine will? Okay, okay. What would you say? Flesh is ornery. Everybody's flesh. Everybody's flesh. And it is a decision. It does bring you to a choice. But the reason why we have to be brought into direct confrontation with the divine will is we really don't want to. It's going to be a struggle for everybody. I'm going to say that about a thousand times tonight. Because one of the struggles in a legacy church, which is what we have 93 years old this year, is after a while you start thinking, I got it all together. I've arrived. And I would argue that that's what the Bible's meaning when it says, if a man think he standeth, take heed lest he fall. You're not going to, I, taught, I taught you this a couple of three, maybe a month, who knows. It, I taught it to you. <laughs> Until this corruptible puts on incorruption, you're in the struggle. Okay? You're in a struggle. Look here. Doctrine, I'm still in review. Doctrine and lifestyle matter. Our salvation depends upon it. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. He told Timothy, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. What does that mean to you? Pay attention to it. Focus on it and stay with it. When you do this, Timothy, who was he? Young preacher, right? Getting ready for being a pastor in training. And he told him, he said, pay attention to it, continue in it, for in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear you. I, I don't... I, if, you, if I love being evangelistic, and if somebody said they wanted to receive the Holy Ghost, we'd stop everything and let them receive the Holy Ghost. But Timothy was being commissioned to lead people who were already saved. This is the church he's talking to. Continue. Take heed unto thyself 
It's how you live your life. It's how you represent yourself. It's what you do and what you don't do in life. To pay attention to, to yourself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. Keep doing it. Persist in it. Keep going in it. You know what that means to me? How long do you continue in it? Till you die. Continue in them, for in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Let's review real quickly. This is not in my notes. It's not on your handout, but I just finished page one. So let's celebrate that by doing something that ain't even in our notes. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's the life of Jesus Christ. It's biographical in nature. It's filled predominantly with the life, the ministry, and the miracles of Jesus Christ and the choosing of his 12 disciples. They are historical books. or They're biographical books. The history of Jesus Christ, how he got here. Death, burial, and resurrection. The book of Acts. That's where you learn how to get saved. The actions of the apostles. The acts of the apostles, what they did. And we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. But Romans through Revelation is written to church people. Folks that are already filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost and baptized in Jesus' name. We can't forget that. It's important. So... Let me back up here. Doctrine and lifestyle matter. They matter. We also learned that doctrine will be a dividing line in the end time. 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 4. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead. That's the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. He told Timothy, preach the word. Be instant, in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Look here. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. So, the Bible has told us prophetically, Brother David, that there will come a time when you will preach truth, as Brother Tripp did, and I watched it, great service, I'm thankful for what he did, but you will preach truth and they'll leave because of it. So, Sister Stephanie, what we preach must matter. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Take me back to what you said a while ago, Brother Johnny. The reason we come in direct confrontation with the divine will, flesh don't like it. So eventually my flesh is going to get tired of it and say, peace out. But after their own lust, which means they will say, I'm going to find me a preacher that preaches a message that fits my lifestyle better. They'll heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, which I'm not going to get into it. But basically, when you start trying to find a preacher that satisfies you, you're going to go from one to the next to the next to the next because ain't nobody going to satisfy you. I don't care how loose they get it. If they get it too loose, you'll say they're too loose. If they get it too tight, you'll say they're too tight. That's why the Bible's got to be the authority, the first authority, the man of God. We're going to talk about the man of God in a minute, but ultimately, the Bible is the authority. So, and they will turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. This is not sinners, it is church folks. Now, a confrontation with the divine will has to happen because the carnal mind is enmity against God. It always has been and it always will be. We're going to discuss enmity. You got me in the New Living Translation yet? Carnal means of human origin or empowerment. Listen, definition. That which proceeds, here we go, Brother Shannon. Last night, people at recovery last night, this ain't going to be new to y'all. 
But I promise I had never occurred to me before, but it makes sense. Carnal. That which proceeds out of the part of us that hasn't been changed yet. Out of the part of us that hasn't been transformed yet. Hmm. Last night, tell me about that, Brother Cody. What did that say, step three? As we understood him. Remember, I saw that on there and got ticked off because I told myself, I already know about the Lord. We ain't even scratched the surface of God yet. Because remember, the closer I get to him, the more glaring my mistakes are. But there's a part of me, this is the Bible. There's a part of me that I ain't surrendered to the Lord yet. How do I know that? Because it shows up every time. Carnality still shows up every time I'm confronted with it. Every time the Lord makes sure that I'm in a position for it to show up, there it is. Huh? Make sense? Everybody with me? Romans was written to believers. Enmity. Here we go. Y'all ready for this? Enmity means hostile and contrary. Of relating to or characteristic of an enemy, opposed in feeling, action, or character, antagonistic. I would argue that the word is always supposed to mess with you a little bit or a lot. I think the word should challenge us always. Preacher and saint alike. The word should challenge us. Because, Brother David, if I haven't made it yet, that means there's still some more work to be done in me. Verse Romans 8 and 7 in the New Living Translation says, For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. That's tough. That's straight. We're going to learn how to break it down. Don't worry. Don't start getting thinking, well, I don't guess nobody can. Y'all read that in the Bible, in the bread here recently, when the ark was coming, and Uzzah got, the Lord said, nope, because he touched it. And then what did David say? Y'all remember what David said after that? He said, I ain't sure nobody can mess with this thing. We're going to park it somewhere. I ain't bringing it no further. We're going to park it. He said, I don't know if anybody can come into the presence of the Lord. And if we're not careful, Brother David, when we teach like this, that's what we'll think too. Man, I just don't think nobody can make it. You're just teaching it so tough, can't nobody make it. Surprise. I'm about to tell you how you can make it. Look here. So, in a collaborative effort, between the Word of God, the Spirit of God, and the man of God, we endeavor to completely crucify every bit of carnality that remains alive in us. Right? Yo, everybody with me? I know my wife likes to tell me, they're just listening, don't worry about it, but say amen or something just every now and again so I know you're awake at least. That's better. Don't say that. That's against the rules. Brother Johnny, old smart aleck behind said, bless him, Lord. That's what they used to say when we was first starting out. And you're looking at your notes and everybody in the whole church knows he done preached everything he got. And it's only been two minutes. And you're up there like in no man's land. And some dear old sister says, Bless him, Lord. 
Tell y'all guys, if y'all ever start hearing, bless him, Lord, bring it together, take it home. You ain't doing so hot, except when it's Brother Johnny. Look here. So a collaborative effort. You know what I mean by that? The Word of God, the Spirit of God, and the man of God are going to work together to give us what we need to completely crucify every bit of carnality that remains alive in us. Now, I've taught this to you many times. I'm going to teach it to you again tonight. We talked about it last night. Just when you think you've got it all crucified, the Lord is going to send, send somebody or something into your life to bring that part that ain't been crucified yet up to the surface. And we've got to have enough sense to recognize that everything goes wrong in our life ain't on account of the devil. And if it's the same thing that you've been having problem with over and over and over and over again, the Lord is letting it come back to the surface so you can get it fixed. Because he wants you to get it fixed. And he gave us an avenue to get it fixed. Now, the manner in which this happens is, once the doctrine has been established, because you can't bring yourself into alignment until you know where the line is. So once the doctrine has been established, or perhaps as it is being established, which means as our revelation be deepens and becomes more and more clear, the process by which that happens is found in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. When Paul once again, speaking to the church, at Rome, he says, I beseech you, therefore. I looked it up. I'd read it, but I looked it up. Therefore is a linking word. It's technically a conjunction adverb. It makes me sound smart, don't it? I looked it up. See, Romans chapter 11, perhaps 10, coming into chapter 12, Really, all first 10 chapters of Romans are doctrinal in nature. So therefore, is linking Romans chapter 1 through 10 to chapter 12. Because 1 through 10 is a doctrinal exposition, which means 1 through 10 is full of the doctrine. Beginning with 12, does anybody know what happens in 12? What do you think happens in 12? You learn how to apply the doctrine to your life. So, the previous doctrinal exposition is bound to a life lived accordingly with therefore. Everybody with me on that? The purpose of teaching and receiving the doctrine is to produce a life that is consecrated for God and His work. The purpose of you coming to church is not just to get your groove on. It is not just for you to feel good, to feel some goosebumps, and to get a little more juice to go out and fight another day. It is to let the Word transform you and you make changes accordingly. God is not going to zap you and make you change to please Him. But he's going to give you the word over and over and over and over. I believe it was Peter who said, it is beneficial for you that I keep preaching the same thing over and over again. So, I beseech you therefore, by the mercies of God, and I believe Brother David has taught us Mercies has to do with me getting somewhere that I couldn't get without the mercy. Because without the mercy, I'd get shot, but mercy stops it. Mercy holds it back. It holds back what I do deserve, so through grace I can get what I don't deserve. Now look here. I beseech you therefore by the mercies of God. Look here. That you, everybody say, that's me. 
present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now, I hope to bring that word out in a way I never have before. What do you think it means? Your reasonable service. Bare minimum, what'd you say? Least you can do. What'd you say, Brother Larry? Well, if you're going to make mistakes, make them loud so we can fix them. No, I'm, just, I'm just teasing. Here, look here. Think about it. What did I just tell you Romans chapter 1 ver through verse number 11 teaches us? Doctrine. And what he's saying is, now that you know what I've taught you, the only reasonable thing to do is give your whole life to the Lord. The only thing that makes sense now that we've taught you the doctrine, the only reasonable thing to do now that you know what God has for you, what's that, friend? Yes. And you know how we do that? Can't be good enough. Present our bodies a living sacrifice to the Lord. And when you know what you know, it's the only thing that makes sense. And that applies to recovery too, Brother Shannon, because nothing I did made sense until I found a process and it makes sense. Once you know the truth, the only reasonable thing to do is to present your body and what does that mean? You are three-part being, spirit, soul, and body. That means all of you is submitted, presented to the Lord as a living sacrifice, which means he can do with me whatever he wants to do with me, Brother Christian, that I'm not holding. I am not retaining any of my rights. All of it. I'm not retaining authority over any part of me. I'm giving it all to him. Because in doctrine, I've learned whatever I keep, I'm messing up. Forget learning that in doctrine. I learned that in real life. Every time I try to take back over. I don't even get off the runway. I crash before I get in the air. All right, let's move. We got to get on. We got to get along. Now. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What does the word renewing mean? How many times? Over and over and over and over again. Because get this, the more you learn, the greater the transformation. And the more I learn about him, the more I become like him. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? Here's what Brother Bernard says about this in his uh, uh, commentary on Romans. With this kind of spiritual transformation and renewing, we can test, approve, or discover God's will. Each one of us can know and do God's will for our lives if we will consecrate ourselves. You can't do it your way Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday and hope you can show up on Sundays and Wednesdays and God balance all the wrong out. We got to consecrate our lives. I, I said this way back when I first started preaching here. This, coming to church, is rest. 
we got to apply what we learn here all them other days out there. Look here, he said, each one of us can know and do God's will for our lives if we, if we will consecrate ourselves. You know what consecrate yourself means? Give yourself a living sacrifice to the Lord. Set yourself apart for the work of the Lord. Devote your life to Him. Give your faculties to Him. In doing so, we will find God's will to be good for us. It's good for us. Acceptable to Him and perfect in everything we apply it to. So His will is good that you may prove what is that good. That means it's good for me. It's right for me. God's will, right for me. Acceptable, it makes me pleasing to him. Holy and acceptable unto God. Remember that? Beginning of Romans 12. And perfect. You know what that means, Brother Christian? It means every area, I feel the Holy Ghost, every area of my life that I apply these principles, his will will be perfect. Not good, not better, perfect. Why didn't it work like that all the time? Because, Brother Johnny, I'm ornery. But I got a pathway. Present my body. That means there is no part of me that I retain control over. I'm giving it to him. No, it is like it. Not kind of. It is like it. Because when I present, oh, Lord, when I present my body to him, I'm presenting me to him, lock, stock, barrel, and cookie crumb. Success and failure. Strength and weakness. Uh, character uh, character uh, awards and character defects. Or the things that are right and the things that are wrong, I'm submitting it all to him. And then I do what he tells me to do. Say, well, what about this and what about that? I was hoping somebody would say that because this is not in your notes either. But you can write it down. 2 Peter chapter number 1 and verse number 3. According as his divine power hath given unto us. Y'all ready for this? All things that pertain unto life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. So the more that we learn about him, the more submitted we become. And the more submitted we become, the stronger we become, and the more complete we become. So the less I figure out I know, and the less gifted I am, and the less talented I am, and the less full of glory that I am, the better off I am. Okay. Everybody okay? Okay. All right. Now, this is why God's will is perfect. This is why on many levels the doctrine of God is so essential because the doctrine of God is foundational, which means it is the doctrine upon which all other doctrine is built. Hebrews 11 and 6 says, But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that put every effort in to seek him. Here's what's happening. I, may, I don't know if I'm going to run out of time first or voice first. The carnal mind operates only in the reality it can see, hear, taste, smell, or touch. All of that is temporal. Meaning everything that you can see, hear, taste, smell, or touch will die. Everything. Death came into the world. And our senses are designed to connect us to the world. 
And when man stopped being governed by God, he became governed by his senses. Come on now, there was a whole generation brought up on if it feels good, do it. Now it has changed, but it's not much. Here's what it is now. If it makes you happy, it's right for you. That's where that nonsense, and I'm going to talk about it later. I'm just going to hit it. That's where that nonsense that the world is preaching right now, find your truth. There ain't no such thing. There's no such thing as your truth. Now, the spiritual mind, on the other hand, operates on faith. The carnal mind operates on vanity. The spiritual mind operates on substance. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Let's go to the doctrine of God. The Bible begins with, in the beginning, God. Genesis 1 and 1. God never tries to prove that Genesis 1 and 1 is true. He doesn't try to convince, compel, prove, etc. that he created the heaven and the earth. He does not try to prove himself. But from the beginning, he simply declares himself. If we can receive, accept, and believe that declaration, he will prove himself to you over and again. But accepting this declaration is a requirement for him to prove himself to you. God will not prove himself to an unbeliever. That's why I am persuaded that blasphemy against the Holy Ghost is a refusal to believe. Because if you won't believe, you can't be saved. If you won't believe, you can't please God. Everybody would believe if God would prove himself to an unbeliever. Besides that, in the scripture, he proved himself over and over and over and over. But when it came down to where the rubber met the road, not one person that he had proved himself to stood with him. That's why we don't believe miracles save you. Miracles are designed that you believe on him. And if you believe on him, you'll do what he says. Look here. There are only three accepted possibilities as to how the universe got here. One is the eternal universe, which means that all this world, planets, stars, sun, earth, everything, has always existed. That's the first idea. The second idea is the self-creating universe, which means it made itself. came to exist under its own power. And the third possibility of how the universe got here is God made it. Except in any of these three involves faith that goes beyond anything science can prove. And to believe, I don't have time to go into it. I, start, I studied it and I read it and I studied it and I read it, but I just don't have time to go into it. But for anybody to believe that the precise order with which the universe operates happened by accident or blind chance takes more faith than to believe God created it. To believe that it just exploded out there on its own takes more faith than to believe God did it. To believe that it was always just there takes more faith than to believe God did it. Then there's a dilemma of the moral nature. Everybody with me on what the moral nature is? 
You may not be, but you will be after just a minute here. C.S. Lewis, whom I'll refer to from time to time because that dude knows how to think. Man, he's, he's just really inspiring me. Here's what he says. Everybody has heard people arguing. However it sounds, he said, I believe we can learn something very important from listening to the kind of things people say when they argue. They say things like, how would you like it if somebody did the same thing to you that you just did to me? You took my seat. I was there first. Leave him alone. He's not doing you any harm. Why should you shove in first? Won't you give me a bite of your orange? I gave you a bite of mine. Come on. You promised. People say things like that every day. Educated people, uneducated people, children and grown-ups. When you argue, you argue from a position that you're right. Now, when you argue, you're not just merely saying that somebody's done something to displease you, but you are appealing to some kind of standard of behavior that you expect the other guy to know something about. That's not how you're supposed to treat people. That's not what you're supposed to say to people. We assume that we're both governed by the same standard of what's decent, moral, and right. Where does that sense of decency come from? Who decided that there was a behavior that was morally correct? See, it's called the law of nature. And it's the only law that we have the ability to disobey. The law of gravity cannot be ignored. You cannot choose to disobey the law of gravity. If you think you can, come up here with me and just step off the end of this platform. You and everybody else in the world will go straight to the ground. The law of biology cannot be ignored. If you go home tonight, eat a bowl of cereal, you cannot decide to not digest it. Your body just does it. You cannot water a plant, put it in the sun, and then tell it, don't grow. By the laws of nature, or the, but the laws of nature, they're not disputed. Everybody knows what's right. Everybody knows that you do not go to the old folks' home and start beating people up. Everybody knows that's wrong. You don't steal candy from babies. Huh? You don't steal little old ladies' purses. Everybody, even the ones that do it know it's wrong. Say, how do you know they know it's wrong? You got a pocketbook? You, you got a pocketbook? You don't want to stand up. Stand, stand up here, Johnny. She don't want to stand up in front of everybody. And I ain't feeling that brave. Look here. Yeah, put your pocketbook on. This little old lady's got a pocketbook. I'm about to steal it. All right? Here's, everybody knows this is how you do it, right? No, what do you do? You book it. Why do you book it? Because you know you just did something wrong and everybody's going to be out to get you. You got a whole bunch of junk in that pocketbook. Dude stole that, he'd be dropping it. Look here. Without the law of nature, without the moral law, chaos would prevail. You would not have a checkout line at Walmart unless everybody understood there's a moral law to live by. 
You wait your turn in line. Break it, law. You're going to jump in front of somebody who ain't taking none of your junk tonight. Yep, you're right. The reason is, is it still right or it's still wrong? Where did that come from? Animals don't do it. Why do you think there's a runt when you have a litter of puppies? Runt can't get in there. You drop a dog food bowl down, they don't know that it's not right to be stingy. They'll eat ever the biggest one, eat everything it can get to. They don't know. But human beings, we know how to act right. We know what's decent. How do we know that? Where did that come from? Because the Lord started telling Adam and Eve, you can eat all of the trees, but don't eat of that one. There's some standards that you got to live by. See, God put it in us. How would a man's finite mind even comprehend the idea of an infinite, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent God unless somebody had revealed it to him? And every society in history has expressed belief in some supreme being. Then, of course, we read it in the Word of God and we experience it, and that confirmed to us that God is alive, he's aware, and he communicates with mankind. Brother Shannon and I have a saying. We text it often, and now other people have picked it up, but you can't make it up. You can't make it up. You can't make it up. God is a spirit, John 4 and 24. He is not made of flesh and blood, bones or physical matter. We cannot see him unless he chooses to reveal himself to us. John 1 and 18, nobody's seen God at any time, but the Son has declared him. God has individuality, which means character that defines him. He has rationality, which means he has the ability to reason. Okay, perfect example, Sodom and Gomorrah. God says, reckon I ought to tell Abraham or not? Because I'm going to destroy him, but I know what Abraham will do. He'll stand in the gap. And he has a personality, which means there's a way God thinks and feels and presents himself. He is self-existent, meaning he got himself here. We don't know how. J Genesis 1 and 1, in the beginning there was God. John 1 and 1 through 3, in the beginning was the Word. He is eternal. Revelation 1 and 8, he said, I am Alpha and Omega, beginning and the ending, which is and was and is to come, the Almighty. And then Isaiah 43 and 10 which he says, you are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. And he is unchanging. Malachi 3 and 6 says, I am the Lord, and I change not. James 1 and 17 says, in whom there is no variableness, every good and perfect gift comes from God in whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. He doesn't change. God is absolutely and indivisibly one. Deuteronomy 6 and 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. This is a part of the Shema. It was in Israel Jewish culture read to every child. They read it while at home and at work. They read it in the morning and in the evening. 
They were to wear it upon their bodies, between their eyes, or on their arms. They were to post it upon the doorpost of their homes. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. There are no distinctions or divisions within him. All names and titles of the deity such as God, Jehovah, Lord, Father, Word, and Holy Spirit all refer to the same being. Any plurality associated with God is only a plurality of attributes, titles, roles, manifestations, modes of activity, or the way he is in relationship with man. He is the Father as it pertains to creation, to the only begotten Son, and the Father of the new birth, the born-again believer. He is the Son, referring to God coming in the flesh, because that which was conceived in Mary was by the Holy Ghost, who literally was his Father. And the Holy Ghost identifies the fundamental character of God's nature. The Holy Ghost is specifically God in activity, particularly anointing, regenerating, and indwelling man. It is God at work because that's how he moves as a spirit. Stand with me if you will. Before we close in prayer, I have post to tell you. Make sure y'all listening to me because I'd be saying a whole lot of stuff at the end of Bible study that y'all don't be hearing. Ain't that right, Brother Derek? And then one time, Brother Shannon tried to pretend like he heard me, and then finally he had to say, I didn't hear it either. <laughs> Brother Donnie called me this afternoon, and uh, he told me to tell the church he went to the doctor yesterday morning and zero cancer anywhere in him. It's all gone. Praise the Lord for that. Sister Sharon has to go to the doctor on Friday, but they do plan to be here Sunday morning. But I knew it would make everyone. He asked me to tell you. They did a scan on him, and they found no sign of cancer at all. One little scar, one little scar, no cancer. So they test him again in three months, but they said they fully anticipate him to be cancer-free. So thank God for that. Praise the Lord for that. And thank you for all your prayers. And, and uh, God's good to us, folks. He's good to us. If we will present our lives to him, our bodies consecrated to him, he'll make sure we make it. Because you never were going to get it by yourself anyway. We need him. For in him, we move and live have our being. Dear Lord Jesus, we love you tonight. God, I thank you for your word. It indeed is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I thank you, God, that you said we get this doctrine. It'll show us what we need to do. and We submit our lives and our bodies and our wills and every bit of us to you. And you'll lead us in the right path and the right direction. God, I thank you for everyone that's here tonight for Bible study. I pray for the sick. Those that are not here, pray for all of our ladies going to ladies' conference tomorrow. Give them safe traveling. Let there be a mighty move of the Holy Ghost. I pray, God, that you'll just keep blessing us. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. One thing real quickly is the 12 hours of prayer list is on the back table. We have two openings, and uh, we need it filled up if we can. If you haven't signed up and you're able to come pray, please do that. We pray all 12 hours here at the church. It'll be open from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. You're dismissed. God bless you.